So let's get going. Uh, of course, Kamara Uday Rao uh, is an alumnus of the fourth integrated course of the Naval Academy in Kochi. He was commissioned into the Indian Navy on New Year's Day in 1974. He's a specialist in missiles and gunnery. He holds an MSc Defense Studies degree from the Madras University and is a graduate of the Defense Services Staff College in Wellington. He has subsequently also been a directing staff on its board. During his 34 years of naval service, Commodore Rao has commanded three frontline ships, the INS Kavarati, the INS Hosdurg, and the INS Gomati. There's also other show units. He was deputed in 1978 to the then Soviet Union for two years for a course in missiles and gunnery followed by appointment as commissioning crew of INS Rajput, also in the Soviet Union. He was a part of the IPKF operations and was Indian Naval Commander at Kankesan Turai in Northern Sri Lanka in 1987. He has also served as Chief Staff Officer at the Navy Office in Chennai, where he oversaw operations in the Pok Bay, the Gulf of Mana, and in the waters around Sri Lanka. An important appointment that he held was that of Principal Director Naval Intelligence at the Naval Headquarters in New Delhi for a period of five years when he interacted very closely with the intelligence entities of the IAF, the Indian Army, and also with national agencies such as RAW and the IB. Commodore Rao has the distinction of having served as a director in the Cabinet Secretariat, where he handles strategic and security issues at the national level. He has also been a diplomat at Indian missions abroad. So pleasure to have you, uh, uh, Commodore Rao, over to you. And we look forward to yet another stimulating session. Thank you, Sashi. Thank you so much for the nice introduction. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you had a nice lunch. I wish uh, we could have given you a maritime lunch consisting of fish and prawns. Unfortunately, we can't do it this time, maybe some other time. Okay, this session is about uh, maritime and coastal security. And we have an impressive lineup of speakers, all very experienced. Now, actually, 2611 is something that, that changed the way we look at coastal security. Many questions remain unanswered about 2611 since there was no inquiry at a national level did we have intelligence did we fail to connect the dots etc i'm sure our speakers will address that but the question is are we any safer today in 2020 the security establishment remains focused on jnk northeast so who's minding the coastal borders the government has done a lot of things but much remains to be done uh, issue is the uh, federal structure of nine coastal states and four union territories. Some of them do not take ownership at all. And they believe it is the center's responsibility. Some of them do not have maritime boards. Now the maritime police do not have the 13 maritime police of each and every state do not have seagoing carders. They don't have training facilities which are dedicated. They're frequently transferred. And therefore, the naval and coast guard training, uh, which uh, we impart, go, dissipates very quickly. The CAG has passed several structures on these uh, maritime police. There's a National Academy of Coastal Policing at Dwarka and Gujarat, which is being set up. And uh, you'll be surprised to know that the headmaster is the BSF, Border Security Force. So what more can I tell about National Academy of Coastal Policing? The Navy and Coast Guard, there's a need to synergize, no doubt. And I'm sure Admiral Murli Dharan will speak about it. But there appears to be some confusion in the role and responsibility of the two services. The Coastal Security Bill 2013 is yet to be passed. Now, actually, the question is, should the Navy be doing coastal security? Or should it be made the exclusive responsibility of, coast, of the Coast Guard and give them a, operational control of the Marine Police? And we should leave the Navy, I feel, uh, free to do blue water operations, nuclear strategy, etc. 
Increasingly, the police top brass are now feel that it's time to move the Coast Guard under the MHA. And there's also talk of a coastal border police force like a central armed police force. So therefore, what will happen is 12 years after 2611, we will be creating a new organization and therefore it will be work in progress. And one more layer, this is a clear indication that the state police is abdicating responsibility. But maybe that is the best way to go. We do not have a proper maritime governance structure. The present structure was made several years ago when uh, sea, uh, the seas had not uh, attained their importance. Okay, we have something uh, the government, uh, BJP government, soon over after taking over, had said that they will set up a national maritime authority. In, they said this in 2014. This is 2021, and there's no sight of this multidisciplinary national maritime authority. So we have a national security advisor, a military advisor, a nautical advisor, but no maritime advisor or maritime authority. To speak on some of these issues or all of these issues, we have great speakers today. And I'm very happy to introduce Admiral Morley Dharan, who's a very well respected and highly professional officer who's commanded three frontline ships, including the destroyer Ranvijay, which is a Soviet acquired ship, acquired from the Soviet Union. He's been a principal director of naval operations at NHQ. He's been an attache in Moscow. So, that's what I'll tell my good friend. He's been flag officer to sea training. He's been a first commandant of the Naval Academy at uh, Aimala. He's been the Director General Coast Guard. He is now uh, in the uh, part of the Armed Forces Tribunal. So you will see that he is a very, very, uh, what should I say, astute person in his capabilities and achievements. And I'm sure he will deal with this topic in all its, you know, glory, I should say. Thank you so much. And over to our Vice Admiral Murli Dharan. Thank you, Commodore Rao, for that very, I would say, flattering introduction. And uh, my fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, uh, let me thank the Institute of Contemporary Studies, Bangalore, the Chennai Center for China Studies, and the Press Institute of India for giving me an opportunity to be part of this uh, very interesting webinar. Uh, we, are, we are discussing issues of critical national importance. Before I move on to how to synergize between the Navy and the Coast Guard and improve their capacity and capability to meet our security challenges, let me actually look at what itself are the security challenges that are facing us. Now, some of this have been covered in its and bits and parts in the previous session. But uh, let me say that the maritime security in the 21st century assumes a much broader definition than the generally perceived purely military one. Towards the close of the 20th century, it was evident that in the maritime arena, security challenges indicate a shift from pure naval confrontation on the high seas to challenges, both conventional and non-conventional in the littoral region. Now, they could be threats to the economic well-being of a nation, which is in terms of energy, trade and commerce, living and non-living resources, or the social stability, which is actually crimes in the maritime arena, or political peace, that's the maritime sovereignty itself, or health of the people, which amounted to the environment. Now, geostrategic significance of the seas are well known to this audience. Nearly 70% of the Earth is covered by sea, and two-thirds of our population lives within 100 nautical miles of the coastline. 80% of all major cities and trade centers, financial centers, are within 200 kilometers of a coastline. And most of the economic and industrial activities also occur in this area. The world trade itself is uh, roughly 80% by volume and 70% by value. And, and there are close to 60,000 ships worth over $450 billion and generating close to 15 million jobs in this arena. As far as India is concerned, we are both a continental as well as a maritime nation, our territory of a little over 3 million square kilometers and land frontiers 15,000 kilometers is where the coastline is 7,500 kilometers. We have nine coastal states, four union territories, and close to 1,200 islands, big and small, 
and an exclusive economic zone of 2.2 million square kilometers with another half a million square kilometers to be added once the continental shelf delineation uh, policies take place now our geographical location close to uh, the choke points of the indian ocean gives us a very vantage position in relation to the entire uh, area from african coast to west asia to southeast asia and now beyond into the pacific ocean so therefore we have a security and stake in all the waters in the indo pacific region even as as mentioned also by our honorable prime minister uh, in the shangri la dialogue a few years ago and needless to say the maritime security environment in and around india has become more complex over the years for a variety of reasons now what are the conventional uh, challenges pakistan our neighbor continues to be inimical to us our critical energy flows from the persian gulf area actually come through the normal traffic lanes are very close to pakistan making the entire thing very susceptible to interdiction in times of conflicts not to mention the unconventional threats posed by the terrorist elements nurtured by pakistan well in a conventional conflict we'll have to actually neutralize or comprehensively marginalize the pakistan naval forces or maritime forces but even in peace time we got to have regular monitoring of our sea lanes to ensure that our shipping is safe as regards china we have heard so much about it in the morning sessions uh, he's got vast economic interest now in the indian ocean region and has been actively engaging with all nations all along this area specifically our neighbors developing their maritime and military infrastructure and also extending economic help to the extent of binding them down in major debt traps now looking at bases they are looking at bases and diplomatic ties from africa to middle east to south asia it's all part of their strategy now we have witnessed confrontation on the land borders i'm not touching on it while i would say that we have an edge over china in the iowa region right now but you have seen how they are developing the navy so it remains a major threat now non conventional military challenge or security challenges would include or what in the navy terms it as the limo or low intensity maritime operations would include maritime terrorism piracy drug and human trafficking gun running poaching and iuu or illegal gathering of sensitive illegal including gathering of sensitive economic data now major problem that we face is that our vast coastline and uninhabited islands of our island chains are all susceptible to use for illegal activities and possibly because of the complexity associated with maritime environment we are fortunate that only about 2% of international terror attacks over the last 3 decades have happened at sea however and today we are having uh, the anniversary of it the 2611 incidents at bombay was an eye opener and therefore any terrorist activity could remain from any sector in the maritime area now drug trafficking and drug running are often adjuncts to terrorism and actually funds terrorism piracy is another major challenge though not exactly in our waters but over the last two decades now we have been associated with uh, you know cooperative we have been doing a lot of patrolling in this area of forces and even now just checking up this morning the piracy reports as per the recap or the uh, which based at singapore on the uh, which monitors the piracy and shares information 89 piracy attempts of various types have taken place even this year when bulk of the year we have lost due to uh, the covid conditions now human traffic trafficking illegal immigration fortunately we are not very much affected by it but it's still a threat <clears throat> if i move to economic challenges essentially it's maintenance of the flow of trade and energy supplies through the sea lanes which pass very close to our waters and almost 80% of the world's trade by volume and in our case it's 90% of the volume is a major challenge now as i mentioned earlier we have a stake in maintaining the communications in the indo pacific remaining open at all time and this would include defense of our offshore coastal and offshore security infrastructure uh, refineries offshore platforms pipelines and single boil moorings we also have a stake in our overseas exploitation 
efforts of oil ex overseas exploration that we are doing now maritime security when i talk of also includes our, our over 2.2 billion square kilometers of exclusive economic zone which i say said will further increase uh, we have a pioneer status of what 1.5 lakh square kilometer in the central indian ocean where we can recover and process polymetallic nodules as soon as the technology becomes more uh, affordable for it we are prospects in antarctica so all this in uh, wealth we need to procure that it is not taken up by surreptitious means by others including gathering of seismic data while we have dedicated sessions on these subjects of iuu fishing i would only say that of almost 20 to 30% of the total fisheries production in the world is suffering due to illegal fishing activities environmental security is another concern with over 60000 ships that transit in the indian ocean major oil spills or even dumping of toxic waste is very much a possibility and if it's close to our shores it can have disaster uh, can be disastrous thing to our environment and livelihood of all people who depend on it search and rescue or humanitarian assistance and disaster relief is another major challenge for security forces at sea and smaller nations in the indian ocean always been looking up to us even recently we provided a lot of help and evacuated even our own citizens from during covid conditions so the challenges to our security agencies range from national purely security to well being and in this regard what commodore was also mentioning we had an overview of the maritime security was undertaken post 2611 and today indian navy is the overall responsible for maritime security which includes coastal and offshore security coast guard the authority responsible for coastal security in territorial waters and overall coordination between central and state agencies in all matters relating to coastal security i will not go deeper into it as we have a separate session on it i would however it will be a very evident that the bulk of security challenges in the maritime field have to be tackled between coast guard and the navy by the regular surveillance and presence now with the navy going into mission based deployment and our own uh, national interest with the policies like sagar and quad extending into the indo pacific our naval forces are mostly up operating out of the area and with uh, support from bilateral agreements they can extend way out into that area and operate there so coast guard would need to step in and look at the entire exclusive economic zone and closer to our waters so therefore both these forces need to have adequate force levels and synergy to coordinate mechanism to achieve common objectives in my view basic synergy between the forces existed right from inception of coast guard itself as the idea germinated following the discussions at the third un conference on loss of the seas in the early 70s so to safeguard national interest in maritime zones of india the expert committee set up <clears throat> recommended that we have a separate force other than the navy and an interim coast guard was created uh, using naval ships on the 1st of february 1977 to take on the non military maritime duties with the then vice chief of the naval staff as an officer on special duty to head it formally the coast guard was formed under the cg act of 19th august 1978 as a fourth armed force of the union under the ministry of defense now as a fledgling service carved out of the navy the initial 10 odd years the naval it was naval ships and the coast guard is entirely manned by personnel both at officer and the ratings level from the navy and similarly was the uh, ships and establishments totally manned it was commanded by coast guard officers or ex ian officers who opted to join coast guard while direct induction of officers and navics to the coast guard started soon after since they had not attained sufficient seniority and experience for some more time the senior hierarchy remained from the navy for an even longer period but new ships soon joined specifically designed to meet coast guard needs and were commissioned gradually the number of naval personnel manning coast guard ships and establishments have come down and today virtually all the posts in coast guard ships and establishments including at senior levels are tenanted by the coast guard officers and men 
while the director general of the coast guard continued to be from navy from the inception except on two occasions when they were held by naval officers who had been permanently absorbed in coast guard from 2016 the director general of the coast guards have also been uh, direct entry coast guard officers as by now they had attained sufficient seniority so how do we then extend this synergy between the two forces a major synergy exists <laughs> because of the initial and subsequent professional training of coast guard personnel at the naval establishments it gets further strengthened at middle and higher level by establishments such as the staff college the naval war college and the national defense college this sharing of facilities and commonality is a major linkage while in coast guard academy was set up our foundation stone was laid very close to the naval academy uh, for a variety of reasons it is not taken off and the venue has shifted but it's to be noted that the coast guard academy will only be to train uh, to train on subjects specific to coast guard needs in my view coast guard should continue to use naval facilities and common professional training as that will build lifelong linkages it will also avoid duplication of facilities and save on manpower and training costs with technology levels going up i'm sure down the years coast guard will look at high even more technically qualified officers and the ideal is there to conjoin them at the cadets level for training at the naval academy <coughs> and they get a four year btec degree while it's no longer essential to have naval personnel to man coast guard units the commonality of training should be used for cross manning of people on ships and selected establishments of each of the forces the large number of small vessels and patrol vessels with the coast guard would provide invaluable sea legs to young naval personnel and similarly coast guard personnel could be deployed in naval units and even common aircraft which we have to create a manpower pool which can be used for deployment during prolonged operations in times of hostilities including if you have to hire vessels from the trade to support our maritime operations now it's coast guard is mandated join uh, jointly operate with the navy to tackle all the security challenges both in peace and hostilities and there's a joint ops room has been set up after <coughs> the last review where all the stakeholders for monitoring and controlling <coughs> activities of coastal security are there further cooperation and transition to water aim role can be achieved through regular exercises while now the coast guard units come in where during major exercises or tactical exercise etc i think on regular basis they should be uh, taking part it will improve operate preparedness for joint missions and similarly the naval opvs and patrol boats could and surveillance aircraft could conjoin the exclusive economic zone patrol <laughs> while i do not intend to do a bean count of what kind of numbers or the platforms both forces need to meet the task envisage because that will be the full session now while we are looking to induct a large number of ships and aircraft however in order to ensure that optimal use of resources and avoid duplication development of plans of both forces and more so for platforms could be fine tuned in consultation with each other there is an existing forum of high level navy coast guard meeting of the nav guard which is jointly chaired by the vice chief of the naval staff and the director general of the coast guard now while it has been established to enhance overall jointness and uh, resolve contentious issues it could be dovetailed to discuss the perspective plans so the requirements of platforms for both the forces could be looked at to an extent <coughs> uh, there is to avoid duplication and similarly the naval specification or uh, specific requirements could be incorporated to the extent possible in coast guard ships at the time of uh, uh, they have been constructed to avoid uh, such as for example to stage through larger naval helicopters on coast guard ships or to even for transiting through them and similarly have fitted for options to retrofit specific naval weapons or sensors which could be used in times of prolonged hostilities and for monitoring such a thing at design stage would enable quick upgrade of the coast guard to enhance their combat combat capability to when called for and to operate alongside naval forces in high threat environments logistics maintenance and communication facilities 
are the other areas for synergy while coast guard initially used to share all that in the navy now they started setting up their own facilities or depending upon commercial facilities for it and we have two, two minutes to go thank you uh they should share facilities with the navy and similarly while uh, synergy at lower levels or working levels is important we need to have it also at higher levels by posting uh, people of the rank of rear admiral commodore ig dig in each other's uh, service at quarter the seaboard at quarter the coast guard regional area levels now with more joint operations that we are uh, trying to look at integration at uh, joint commands etc while well, we started with the coast guard component in the port blair area in the tri service command we could do so at the cds team at cds staff and the integrated staff well i would say i would not say that all this would remove uh, all the because there will always be the kind of sibling rivalry in between the services and by and there is also difference in service conditions but these would go a long way in synergy <clears throat> i would take a minute more to say that i read some media reports that dgps have been recommending to the home ministry to bring coast guard under mha for better coordination of multiple central agencies the report talks of shallow water operations and coastal communities interaction well coast guard and the navy all there already does to an extent regular interaction and similarly purely to shift it to mod i think would mod to mha would be counterproductive maritime security is far more than coastal patrolling and you can't look at it through the prism that you are doing a bsf or itp itbp is doing at land borders now as i mentioned mission based deployments in the navy are taking it further away therefore the coast guards used to be uh, look at more at our area like the us coast guard looks at their areas in this at this juncture i would also say that we worthwhile considering for synergy a recommendation that was made past 2611 but we did not accept it that is to have a cnc coastal command at the level of a vice admiral of a navy to whom the coast guard and all other units responsible for coastal security would report and the cnc himself would be reporting to the chief of the naval staff now australia has a similar organization it would not only foster closer links between navy and the coast guard but would also be in keeping with the vision of our former raksha mantri the late mr banohar parikar who talked of seamless synergy between indian coast guard and the indian navy at all levels i would sum up by saying that maritime security challenges are today transcending political borders so cooperation intelligence surveillance network data sharing and effective patrolling would allow nations and maritime agencies to monitor oceans more effectively our navy and coast guard have been interacting regularly with other maritime forces to enhance interoperability and confidence building so therefore a coordinated and consolidated approach between the maritime forces primarily the navy and coast guard uh with all other stakeholders would be is the need of the war to meet our maritime security challenges thank you thank you admiral uh, that was a very insightful talk and your pitch for synergy uh, had, oh, carried the right notes uh, with that uh, we'll move on to the next speaker captain himadri das Himadri is currently at the National Maritime Foundation. Uh, he is a navigator by specialization and has uh, an extensive uh, experience in uh, training assignments at the Naval Academy, at the ND School, at the uh, workup team. He is a scholar sailor, a cerebral type. Uh, he has written a book on coastal security. He is writing one on uh, maritime governance. He's also worked with maritime doctrine and concepts. As you can see, he has a large number of achievements in the academic field, maritime academic field. And um, we look forward to uh, Himadri Das and his talk. Over to you, Himadri. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I think it's an honor for me to be here this uh, afternoon among this distinguished uh, panel here. Indeed, there could not have been a more suitable day to discuss uh, coastal security, today being the uh, 12th uh, anniversary. At the outset, I'd like to convey my sincere gratitude to the organizers, especially Commodore Vasan, Commodore Rao, for having given me this opportunity, and to Aishwarya for all the help that she's provided 
in the last few days. I'll begin the presentation with a few slides, uh, which I think perhaps will set the context of what we're going to discuss about. The threat from maritime terrorism is, is, is real. While we don't really have any particular headlines in 2020, a few days earlier, the Chief of Naval Staff and the Chief of Air Staff highlighted the dangers from a syndicate and, uh, and the need to uh, contend with that. A few more headlines again from 2019. I think what's important to uh, note is the increasing role of intelligence agencies in the maritime security framework and that several states uh, have been the uh, focus of threat. Moving on to the presentation, uh, after a brief introduction and a recap of the construct, I will move on to the more substantive part of the presentation, which is the challenges and the prospects. Uh, Komala Rao in his introduction did mention some of the challenges and I'll try and uh, amplify on those as we move ahead. Uh, the long coastline and uh, uh, the number of islands, etc., cetera, are, are pretty well known. Uh, Commodore Rao in the opening uh, address did mention about the federal government structure and I think it's a very important point that he made and like to reiterate that. So what really happens is that uh, we have about 13 different administrative units and if we go down to the district level, there would be about 70 different administrative units who handle uh, security matters and that itself uh, is a challenge. Uh, the economic importance of the coast needs uh, no reiteration to this August uh, audience. This was also highlighted by the Prime Minister during his Independence Day speech uh, earlier this year. But I'd just like to make a few points about the developments recently. Uh, and so far as uh, ports are concerned, the, uh, in the government's effort to transform the ports and create world-class inland waterways, the Prime Minister announced uh, renaming the Ministry of Shipping as the Ministry of Port, Fishing, or Cycling, Port, Shipping, and Waterways. And uh, I think that also brings about greater clarity about the distribution of work in the government as far as these sectors are concerned. Uh, the second uh, point I think the development has been the announcement of the Pradhan Mantri Matsya Sampada Yojana earlier this year. It's a 20,000 crore project over five years. And earlier this morning, we uh, heard Dr. Das talking about binaries, about security and development, etc. And I think uh, what I see is a convergence because this program does cater for security requirements as well. Uh, on the tourism front, uh, uh, I think about 10 odd beaches have been given an international certification of blue flag. And essentially it meets certain safety, security and other criteria. Historically, uh, uh, both Komodo uh, Rao and Admiral Mulligan did cover aspects. And I think uh, there are four main drivers of the construct that we have. Some of them are flashed on the screen. I think the Mumbai blasts of 1993 highlighted uh, the dangers or the potential uh, which criminal animals can you know, rapidly metamorphose into more insidious threats. And uh, Admiral Mulida did mention border a little while earlier. And I think the first wave of re reforms in the maritime security governance structure was the uh, group of ministers report of 2001, uh, which led to the state marine police and other developments in intelligence, etc. Uh, finally, the uh, today is 12 years since 26 11 uh, 2008, and I think that brought about uh, what I would say the second wave of reforms in maritime security governance in India. Uh, Admiral Mondeser did mention uh, some of the non-traditional threats, and what I have flashed on the screen is a summary of what we have witnessed in India in this year and I have sourced it from the IFC IOR monthly updates which are available on their uh, website. So uh, essentially we have uh, most of the threats that I've been uh, mentioned about. But I'd just like to make uh, two points here. Uh, maritime crime is indeed endemic to various uh, areas in India. And the second point is that in a country which has recorded more than 52 lakh cognizable crimes in 2019, I think uh, in sheer numbers, the crimes are insignificant. But again, the Mumbai blasts uh, are a poignant reminder of the dangers if you, if you don't uh, 
uh, keep a watchful eye on crimes in all its, all its forms. Uh, some of the concerns uh, we heard Captain Agarwal uh, speaking this morning on the Chinese research ships in the Indian Ocean uh, region. Uh, we had some Chinese vessels also in the uh, Indian EZ who were investigated about. And uh, so that's one of the linkages with the overall theme of this. And so how do we actually link up? Actually, many of the systems that were established post-2611, such as the MDS system, the Information Management Center, uh, which is monitoring many of these activities, uh, provide the foundations to uh, respond to such threats. Uh, I'll just cover the coastal security construct uh, very briefly, just for a recap uh, requirement. And really, really because this, uh, this the theme of this session is on governance, uh, this is a broad governance structure uh, which we have uh, anywhere. Uh, coastal security uh, essentially is, uh, involves various segments. And in the con in, uh, as per the uh, Schedule 7 of the Constitution, these responsibilities are distributed between the center and, and state. So what you have is uh, a large number of uh, stakeholders in this entire construct who work under the center or the state and they need to interweave their initiatives into one comprehensive arrangement. So coordination does uh, become a challenge. As far as responsibilities are concerned, the Department of Border Management in the MHA is actually responsible for all matters related to coastal borders, but excluding those which are the responsibility of the MOD and the MEA. Uh, towards the last part of uh, last year, uh, the Department of Military Affairs was also created under the MOD, and therefore uh, the MOD has uh, the IN and the DMA and the Coast Guard and the DOD, and that's at the new dis uh, a dimension to how maritime security will be managed. The MHA, as was brought out earlier, does not have a force under itself. Uh, the state and the coastal police provide uh, that element uh, of the uh, defense. Uh, this slide really uh, represents the outer limits of jurisdiction, which starts from the uh, baseline of India. The, the state marine police is restricted to five nautical miles in your capability gaps and overlap is provided by the uh, Coast Guard. As far as the uh, policy coordination mechanisms are concerned, we've really seen a development post 2611. Earlier, there was essentially state level initiatives and post 2611, what we've seen is the, the expansion of this coordination right from the district level up to the national level and thereafter. But what it really lacks is an apex level standing body at any level. We've also seen some efforts at zonal coordination uh, to the interstate state councils or at the police level, et cetera. But I think that's also going to be one of the things for the future as to how do you coordinate in respective um, states. In addition to these designated uh, uh, forums for coastal security, you have a large number of other forums where uh, coastal security issues are discussed or other security issues, and, and they all add up uh, into the overall effort at uh, strengthening security in India. We have been discussing uh, MDA uh, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Das in the uh, morning did mention that we've been largely event driven uh, and rightfully so the uh, MDA effort really uh, uh, went to the next level after 2611, not that we didn't have systems earlier. We had this certain legacy systems and they've now all been combined with electronic surveillance. A primary among them is the radar chain which the Coast Guard established and the NAIS chain which was established by the uh, Director General of Lighthouse and Lightships. And important, uh, uh, I, I think this was a revolution in the way uh, we do MDA in India was the setting up of the NC3I uh, network. Uh, what this network essentially does is it links up the Navy and the Coast Guard and interfaces a large number of sensors and databases. But what's important to know is what it does not do. What it does not do is does, it does not link all the stakeholders in the, uh, co the coastal security construct, and it does not uh, integrate all uh, sensors or databases that are nationally available. As far as operational coordination is concerned, I highlighted uh, how intelligence integration has uh, improved over the years, and the multi-agency center continues to be the principal mechanism for, for information uh, sharing, uh, intelligence sharing. And it is no secret that a large number of operations in recent times have been intelligence driven. As far as operational coordination is concerned, what we see is at the foundational level is the hub and spoke model, 
which is between the coast guard and the marine police where after uh, the navy and the coast guard were linked and the apex level we have the joint uh, operation centers moving on to the wider uh, community going beyond uh, beyond security agencies uh, you have the fishery sector the fishery sector has actually seen a large number of initiatives over the last 12 years uh, and these have been taken both by the center and uh, so right on top what i've written is about the tracking system of the transponder system uh, which recently has uh, earlier this year finished its trials and is now ready to be uh, deployed uh, we've had initiatives taken by the tamil nadu with the thondi lab or karnataka with the kadalu app to go on about trying to monitor movements of boats etc and a whole lot of other uh, initiatives to improve the monitoring and control of such systems the important ones of course are the setting up of the department of fisheries as a department by itself the the land ministry matsya sampada yojana uh, we are also steering a uh, national maritime fisheries uh, act and some states like gujarat have already strengthened their fisheries act and some other states such as karnataka are in the process of strengthening their acts for fourth the concerned uh, the major ports are uh, isps compliant which is an international uh, uh, is an international code Uh, of the IMO and the non-major ports are governed through certain uh, guidelines which have been incorporated. Community engagement, which actually uh, started uh, in the maritime context after Opswan uh, through setting up of uh, by the Navy and the st state governments certain uh, uh, groups, has actually uh, uh, consolidated itself and it's now all over India and uh, we've taken a large number of initiatives in that regard. But what we don't really have is an institutional mechanism uh, such as the uh, civil defense of the home guards or and and on a pan india basis actually as far as training is concerned uh, dr rao did mention about the national academy of coastal policing which was set up the bsf but the navy and the coast guard continue to provide training to the police and other central armed police forces i think the coastal security exercises which are held twice the year conducted by the coast guard i think are unique by themselves and i, I don't think they have any land based parallel within the entire machinery of a state uh, actually activates itself for a couple of days and uh, uh, go uh, check the responses and the uh, address vulnerabilities etc xic vigil uh, uh, 2000 2019 was i think a high point uh, in so far as uh, uh, the progression of the construct was concerned because we got the entire nation Uh, to act together uh, uh, for a couple of days and uh, we did audits and contingencies and i think it was the largest ever deployment of assets uh, for a maritime exercise uh, in india perhaps anywhere in the world and now moving on to the most substantive part uh, i thought some of those uh, in the in, in the discussions and the while i was doing uh, the first of course is apex level coordination uh, in 2001 the group of ministers uh, did recommend an apex body for maritime affairs to provide institutionalized linkages between the navy and uh, the coast guard uh, this was also announced by the president in 2014 the government's intention to set up an nma the standing committee of defense also recommended a maritime commission in 2014 the public accounts committee recommended the uh, the need for an effective mechanism for coordination and this was again reiterated by them in 2000 20 so uh, what we have is uh, the ncs ncs which is the apex body which is chaired by uh, uh, the cabinet which is chaired by the cabinet secretary and uh, secretary level officers the chief of naval staff the dgcg are members of this committee so i think that was the first way point as we move ahead uh, on the track to improve our governance structures the second way point of course would need to be a national uh, level body we have uh, already spoken of certain overlapping responsibilities between ministries and agencies like the uh, navy and the coast guard uh, admiral mulidhar did mention about those themselves and i just like to spend a little while on this slide uh, this actually is a schematic which represents uh, the relationship and overlaps between maritime security agencies what really happens is over time they they evolve and they are de depend on a large number of factory uh, factors which could be the threat perception which could be legacy issues the method of governance in respective countries etc etc but 
in most countries uh, it's a hybrid model where uh, maritime security agencies actually have overlaps in their function and that's true in india as well wherein you have the navy the coast guard the police and the customs the marine enforcement wing etc all working together to one despite them having their primary roles separately for this uh, the idealized structure uh, is, is perhaps only in one country and that's perhaps the united states and i don't think there are any other country which has a purely idealized where they, they were completely distinct even in the case of uh, india as uh, what about there as in modis and earlier the raising of the coast guard in 1974 uh, i mean uh, the discussions in 1974 the navy proposed the raising of a coast guard towards uh, this clear distinction of responsibilities and the group of ministers report of 2001 also recommended a one border one force uh, model so that's perhaps the second challenge what really happens is that when there are overlaps it could lead to dilution of focus from the primary responsibilities and that also increases uh, the scope of friction but madhavi uh, just practice, three minutes more right so uh, the legal challenges are several uh, 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 what's happening is that uh, we are working on anti maritime piracy bill of 2019 and an mfra which i mentioned about and the state uh, mfras uh, the four challenges about the sensor coverage uh, 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 we've worked a lot on the sensor coverage issue but are we uh, do, can we achieve seamless gap coverage is one of the issues that i i i, I mull over and i think that's uh, that's quite a challenge that we have early in the day we heard uh, the professor speak about satellite coverage and we have indeed uh, used satellite uh, based uh, uh, coverage uh, to some extent national mda is uh, we, what i already have mentioned about many of our sensors not being integrated the sixth channel is of course about fisheries mcs or monitoring control and surveillance it actually involves two segments one is the small boat tracking where we talk of the transponders and when, when we look up ashore it's about uh, the movement ashore and some steps have take, been taken by steps but i think we are uh, far away from uh, a robust system of monitoring of movements Uh, port security we generally have achieved the minimum standard which is internationally acceptable which is the ISPS code but uh, considering the threat perception that we have uh, uh, i think we need to perhaps go beyond that as far as non major boats concerned is we have a guidelines from the center but they are not mandatory and i would think that we would like we would need to go down the mandatory route sooner than later uh, maintenance of uh, uh, small craft especially of the state marine police has been a matter of concern it's also been have been a matter of concern for larger forces as well so uh, i think that's one area where really where the technical groups really need to work on how how do we get it done best and moving on to the prospects uh, commander wasson in one of his recent artic articles mentioned the situation of cautious optimism and i think i agree with him and what i'll try and do is in the next two minutes cover the cautious part and the optimism part the optimism first i think uh, there's going to be incremental progress in strengthening of maritime security and coastal security in india and i think there's no doubt about that uh, i uh, have a little difference with commander rao about the role of states in maritime security uh, my reading is that the states are going to take uh, a larger part and that's uh, based on whatever research i have done i also see that there is going to be increasing internalization of security issues in development agenda as witnessed in the pmmsy program the nma and nmda form will certainly be progressed in some form or the other it's taken a while but i think these are ideas whose time has come i'm fairly certain that maritime security laws will continue to get strengthened uh, it's a nascent subject and it will take time and so it's going to happen uh, the mda concept will get widened we spoke of uda we spoke of space and uh, all the contiguous domains will get integrated into the mda concept there is going to be greater interagency coordination and breaking the the process of breaking of silos will continue i i have seen a group of three more slides sir i'm going to finish uh, 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 i have seen the role of the state marine police increase over time they getting involved in disaster response search and rescue lockdown implementation etc and i see that only growing with time they have a capacity constraint but uh, i think that's getting better fisheries mcs is improving much of the coastal security effort is based on indigenous ship building and technologies and that's going to help us in other fields as well uh, the community is going to get uh, uh, there is going to be greater maritime consciousness 
as far as the uh, caution which is concerned is uh, the the threat from sea bomb threats is real uh, local maritime crimes will continue to be endemic and we need to be watchful of that uh, achieving grab free surveillance i think is improbable and uh, operational commanders have to be aware aware of that and uh, another thing of note is that there is going to be continued disparity between states all states won't respond equally each has its own constraints threat perception etc strengthening of smp as brought about by commander rao will indeed be slow because it depend on the mha for financial support there is a high chance of mismatch between promise and delivery between projects and their implementation and uh, because of the overlaps there is going to be chances of higher friction which uh, admiral mulithan spoke about and they have to be managed uh, last slide sir uh, uh, particularly i'm particularly interested i don't have an answer is how would the dma uh, and the uh, theater command interface with the coastal security construct the second is do we need to continue in hybrid models or do we go down the idealization uh, path which i showed in the slide earlier and uh, 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 when we say about institutionalizing community support do we go down the militia road or are we just okay with the systems that we have in, in conclusion uh, as brought out in the uh, beginning part of this uh, uh, session uh, indeed uh, much progress has been made but there still are several gaps to address and as our external affairs minister had mentioned that border guarding is a 24/7 operation it's not an event it's got an ever widening scope and it's an endless process in itself thank you very much and i hope i have not exceeded my time uh, thank you very much uh, thank you himadri that was a very brilliant talk very exhaustive and uh, um, i'm sure your pictorial will be of uh, a lot of use to our youngsters who may not know the lay of the land or lay of the sea for that matter so the pictorial talk was very good i, I noticed that you're very optimistic but don't forget that jaisha mohammed and lashkar e taiba and kasabs are not going to wait for all our things plans to fall into place but uh, we can have different opinions i agree with what you have said uh, that is a good talk well done and now of course we move on uh, to the next speaker that is uh, mr sandeep punitan who is the executive editor of india today he is a well known figure in uh, defense and security uh, circles i'm sure you see him constantly on tv and lighting us on various aspects of the issues on defense and security uh, he's written a book on uh, called black tornado it's here uh, i have read his book very interesting uh, and i believe he's written another book called operation x so we look forward to his talk on lessons of 2611 i may tell you that uh, he comes from a naval family very much like me and therefore uh, it's over to mr sandeep punitan now thank you thank you komdo rao um, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen um, it's a pleasure to be here with you it's an honor in fact to address you here this afternoon and uh, as my speakers before me have mentioned that this is a, a very solemn occasion that uh, we are speaking on today this is the 12th anniversary of the 2611 attacks and uh, everyone remembers where they were today 12 years ago uh, when terrorists were running were rampaging through the city of mumbai uh, you know attacking at will bombing and shooting uh, innocent civilians and my thoughts uh, are with the families of uh, the uh, people who've lost their near uh, near and dear ones and uh, with that i move on to my presentation i uh, is are you seeing the screen I, i'm having a bit of a problem here is it uh, is it clear now uh, it is the same format all of them are up in the same screen you oh. have to select them individually and blow it up sandeep you are in the sorter mode go to okay. the slide show mode yeah now it's the original one now you just go to the slide show mode Oh, okay okay sorry google hangouts is not my thing it's usually <laughs> zoom and uh, 
uh, this Skype for me. So is it is it clearer now? Yeah, we can see it now. Don't worry too much. You can proceed because we can read it. Oh, okay, perfect. So I, what I, my point was that uh, in what we're witnessing in India and indeed in Mumbai over the last few years, it's it's actually the weaponization of terrorism. It's not so much terrorism as much as it's proxy war, and uh, it, it's the act of a state actor that's using a non-state actor to paint these off as uh, you know uh, uh, random acts of terrorism for reasons of plausible deniability and what have you. Now in 1993, the first lesson of course is the fact that Mumbai 2611 was not the first attack. You had the 1993 Mumbai serial blast, it was called Bombay in those days, it, at 13 different locations on the 13th of March where 300 persons were killed and 400 persons were injured. It's the largest attack of its kind in the world at that time. And very interestingly, there's a phase two of these attacks where underworld gangsters who've been trained in Pakistan to use AK-47s and throw grenades uh, uh, were uh, supposed to attack targets in Mumbai, like the Mantrale building, the BMC building, and gun down government officials. Now that plan, fortunately for us, uh, didn't come to fruition because the trained youth somehow lost their nerve and thank God for us, panicked and ran away. Then in 2006, you have the second major such attack, which is seven bombs going off simultaneously on seven moving suburban trains in Mumbai, where 209 persons are killed and 700 people are injured. Then 2611, you know what happened? Uh, a fishing trawler anchors off the coast. It discharges a, a rubber uh, boat where 10 lashkar e taiba terrorists are on board and they come in ashore, split into five buddy pairs and uh, proceed to target key installations across the city. 166 civilians are killed and uh, police personnel lose their lives before the terrorists are neutralized several days later. Now, all of these attacks have something in common and you don't have to be a military analyst to figure out what. They're all well coordinated. If you look at it, whether it's uh, starting from the left to the right, it, it's the 1993 serial blast, the 2006 blast, and 2611. They're all coordinated to go off in near simultaneous time, whether it's bomb blasts or the fact that you have these. Sandeep, you're still on the same slide. Uh, oh, right. Sorry. Is it visible now? Yes, yeah, visible. Oh, perfect. Okay, so I was just explaining the fact that all three attacks are very well coordinated. Um, and you know, whether it's 93 or it's 2006 or 2008. Now, these are the three biggest attacks that have taken place over a 15 year period in Mumbai. And all of them are well coordinated. Uh, they happen within a span of a few hours in Mumbai, uh, in all, all three uh, attacks. It's a very similar pattern. Now, when I see a pattern like this, the first, the obvious thing is that this is something that's taught to special forces usually. You know, when you're asked to attack simultaneously to overwhelm the UDA loop of your enemy, overwhelm him, you know, make him think that you are many more uh, in number than you actually are, and you know, uh, overwhelm your uh, security forces, their response, etc. So, my question is that could these attacks have all been military special forces attacks actually carried out by civilians. Uh, the civilians could be gangsters, they're fidayin or uh, non-state actors, but all these attacks, because they follow a certain pattern, they all seem to have their origin in the military. And this is lesson number two. And this I got from a Marine commander who I was interviewing for the book, uh, Black Tornado. And he mentioned the fact that, you know, the strange thing about this attack is, this is something what we practice for. This is exactly how we train. We are brought in covertly near an enemy shore. We are launched by a rubber boat uh, stealthily. We hit the shore. We break up into buddy pairs. We go and hit the targets and then extract, uh, come back to our boat. And then, you know, there's a complete extraction phase. Mumbai 2611, to my mind, is nothing but a military naval special forces raid carried out by non-state actors with the support of the deep state. And I'll explain how. Uh, so when the minute I heard this, I started going through all my notes and looking for a naval connect in these uh, attacks. And sure enough, I come across the 
interrogation of uh, David Headley by the NIA in uh, New York about 10 years back, where Headley tells them something very interesting that uh, he, there was actually a Pakistan Navy frogman called Abdur Rahman who meets the LET leadership in Muzaffarabad. And he actually advises them on how to go about this raid. Now, Headley describes this uh, meeting that taking place in March of 2008. And this person who he calls Abdul Rahman is a clean shaven man in his mid thirties with a crew cut. And uh, he believes Rahman to be a frogman of the Pakistan Navy. But he also believes that Abdul Rahman was not his real name because Headley was introduced to him as Abdul Qadir. Now, Rahman has been brought in for a very key uh, phase of the planning that he's brought with him a, several nautical charts of the West Coast of India. And uh, he's starts discussing options of where to land the LET squad. He gives them very interesting inputs like, you know, drop the attackers 60 kilometers off the coast to avoid detection. Uh, he asked the LET to complete all their planning before June. And this is very interesting again, because uh, this is uh, because the seas in Mumbai, he says, become um, very rough during the monsoons. And uh, so he also probably told them the exact time and the date when to strike. And, he also asked them to check the position of the naval warships in order to avoid an engagement at sea. And the meeting was very detailed. It continued for a second day. Headley wasn't part of the meeting on the second day. Um, I, I really wonder what transpired there. But the fact is that this is possibly the clearest link of a military involvement, a naval involvement with the planning of 2611. And this kind of solves one of the biggest mysteries of how a group called the lashkar e taiba which is primarily a landlocked militant outfit which operates across the you know uh, in kashmir and a few urban terror attacks how it suddenly gets the expertise to launch a special forces raid across the sea and you know insert these uh, 10 terrorists using the classic techniques that a naval special forces team would use and headley of course works on these uh, uh, aspects and he goes back to Mumbai. He's of course running a cover over there. He's running a travel agency and he goes and starts wrecking the spots, the landing spots. He hires a fishing trawler, you know, goes around Mumbai, the coast. He looks for uh, places for the attacks uh, team to land. He gets GPS coordinates. He gives them back. There's a lot of planning. There's a lot of back and forth that takes place before the uh, attackers actually land there. Now, um, what additional help could a naval uh, a, a, a state actor like a naval force have given these terrorists when they infiltrated across uh, Karachi to come to Mumbai. Now, the fact is that in 2008, November of 2008, when the Al Husseini, which is the lashkar e taiba vessel, starts its journey from Karachi, you have a very significant exercise of the Navy that's going on there. It's tropics. It's their annual exercise. It's a gigantic exercise. And this coincidentally is the time that this LET vessel chooses to sail through. And who but a naval force could have given them the time, uh, indicated the passage to infiltrate through the Indian Navy and the Coast Guard that are out there, and even suggest possibly uh, the strategy of hijacking an Indian fishing vessel like the Kuber, which the LET finally did. Um, to you know completely to complete this thing of a Trojan horse coming into the Indian shores. Uh, now this is, I, I go back to how it works on the line of act, uh, on the line of control with Pakistan. How does the Pakistan army uh, facilitate infiltration across the LOC, which it's very simple. The Pakistan army is the nodal agency. Militants are brought to an army camp. Uh, they're kept there uh, for days till the time. Uh, there's a perfect time that's uh, they figured out for crossing. And uh, they're given the weapons, they're given an, the, the equipment, the guide even, and then they're infiltrated across the LOC. The army gives them the exact location of where to infiltrate, and they even give them the covering fire, which is what you frequently see now on television. The, the firing is basically to cover the uh, ingress of the uh, militants. And this possibly is exactly what happened in 2611. The Pakistan Navy gave them the exact uh, time, the place, and the uh, you know the exact route with which to infiltrate and they coincidentally infiltrate when tropics is in its withdrawal phase when all the ships are actually going back back to their ports and i'm sure a lot of uh, 
uh, the service officers here would know what that phase is like when everyone's in you know in a in a hurry to get back home. You're tired, spending weeks out at sea, and this is when the Al Husayni makes its journey through to the coast of uh, off the coast of Gujarat, where it hijacks the Kuber. Now, if you ask someone, say from the Mumbai police, who the perpetrators of all these attacks in 1993, uh, 2006, and 2008 were, the obvious answer would be, oh, 93 was the Mumbai underworld. Uh, 2006 was LET and, uh, uh, LET and Indian Mujahideen. And uh, 2008 was LET, very clear. A few others would say, well, you know, it's the ISI. They're behind all these guys and you know, they're non-state actors. And, now, this is where this elaborate game of smoke and mirrors comes in, this whole narrative building that uh, kicks in, uh, which is why we miss the big picture, which is the identity of the perpetrator of all these terror attacks and indeed the proxy war that we've been at the receiving end for several decades is nothing but the Pakistan army. And uh, the deep state in Pakistan is actually run by the Pakistan army. And this is the creature that we're dealing with that uh, is an organization that you know, learned the tricks of the trade during the Afghan war between 1979 and uh, 1988. And it learned its game there. And it supersized that game. It started this uh, with uh, uh, considerable success, according to them, in Kashmir, where they've tied down a large number of Indian forces there. And slowly, they've infiltrated these techniques into the Indian mainland, starting with uh, Delhi and they've, you know, the attacks in Mumbai that I mentioned. And uh, now the interesting part is that the hand of the ISI is very clear in all of these attacks, especially when you look at 1993, which is when the underworld, this uh, Dawood Ibrahim gang is recruited to launch, um, uh, you know, the, to smuggle RDX and train youth into Mumbai to carry out those serial blasts that I just mentioned. Now, uh, the interesting part is this guy called Tiger Memon, who's this Dawood Ibrahim gang member on the ground, uh, who's actually the, the key person planning and executing these attacks. Uh, there's a transformation in Tiger Memon uh, when he visits Dubai and uh, Pakistan, uh, you know, one of his trips before the March 93 attacks. When he comes back from these trips, he starts talking to his gang members like a general. I mean, his idea, I mean, he starts talking about targeting uh, you know, oil refineries, the Mumbai Stock Exchange, the international airport, five-star hotels, you know, government buildings, and his gang members are horrified. I mean, he's talking like a military man. And this is what, uh, to a lot of you in, in the armed forces, would be like someone drilling out a list of uh, vital areas and vital uh, targets. And this is exactly how did this two-bit silver smuggler, silver and gold smuggler turn into this uh, you know, this military mind, who gives him the vision and the ideas for all of this. And we have to look no further than Lieutenant General Javed Nasir, who was the DG ISI at that time. Uh, now, Javed Nasir is one of the most controversial figures within the Pakistan army, at, even at that time. Uh, he was the DG ISI, like I mentioned. He advocated a bigger role for Pakistan fighting for persecuted global Muslims, and he's a sort of an Islamist Trotskyite, and uh, you, this, and what was his position before DGISI? And you won't believe this. It, he was the director general of the Pakistan Ordnance Factories. Uh, this is the Pakistan Ordnance Factories that actually supplied nearly one ton of RDX uh, to blow up buildings in Bombay in '93. And the RDX is what was uh, shipped in on the uh, boats ahead of the uh, 1993. Uh, serial blasts, and that is where the maritime link comes in. Now, who was the DG ISI in 19, uh, 2006, and indeed becomes the army chief in 2008 when the terror attacks are carried out? It's none other than General Ashwak Kayani. Uh, he is possibly the only Pakistan uh, DG ISI to have become army chief. This is the only time it's happened in Pakistan's 73 year history. And of course, it's just a coincidence that uh, he would have, uh, you know, been this very key person who knew everything that was going on in the ISI and in the Pakistan army. And this is the person who was there in these two uh, at very, very significant terror attacks in 2006 and 2008. So let's just consider what a neutral witness has to say about 
the identity of these perpetrators. I mean, of course, if it comes from us, then we are biased because we have an axe to grind against. Sandeep, the three minutes more. Yes. So I'm I'm just finishing up. So the there's a book by Dr. Hein Kiesling, uh, who's a German researcher, a German political scientist who's lived in Pakistan for 13 years. He's written one of the uh, handful of books on the ISI. Uh, it's called Faith, Unity, and Discipline, and uh, he says very clearly in this book, you should read it. It's, he says that uh, an analysis, I'm just reading out from the book, an analysis of the Mumbai events must ask the question whether the leadership of the ISI and the GHQ were informed beforehand about the planned terror attacks. Uh, one answer common among writers is the idea of an ISI within an ISI. He says this is erroneous and this phrase must have been deliberately created by the ISI itself. He says Pakistan's prime intelligence service is strictly led it's an efficiently run organization with no room for groups pursuing their own secret agenda. And operations such as the Mumbai attacks, which needed expert technical assistance, um, money and time to prepare, could not have been carried out or kept hidden without the service's leadership. Considering the political explosives of the, uh, explosiveness of the event, the chief of the army staff would have to be, have been informed. Now, why did they do it? Uh, simple answer because they could. Pakistan has two strategic assets. It's got the shield of nuclear weapons and it's got the sword of the so called uh, non state actors, the terrorist groups. And it's over the years, it's combined both of these into what Commodore Uday Bhaskar calls nuclear weapons enabled terrorism, which is the shield of nuclear weapons protecting the sword of this death by a thousand cuts guerrilla war. And uh, the narrative that's being built is that if you touch us, we are going to nuke you. Uh, that narrative has continued for over 30 years. It's changed a bit somewhat. I'll just come to it in my last slides. The lessons for uh, uh, lesson number four is, of course, coastal security and coordination. My speakers uh, before me have spoken about it extensively, Admiral Murli Dharan um, and uh, Captain Das. But the most important lesson to me has been coordination, the fact that Earlier, you were basically working in silos. And post-2611, one of the biggest achievements of the government has been to get all the stakeholders to speak on the same table, get them to meet across a table. One of the most important uh, uh, parts of this is the, the multi-agency uh, the, the, uh, multi center that's run by the IB, which uh, the MAC, which meets every single day. And uh, that is to me, one of the biggest intelligence related uh, uh, breakthroughs of post 2611 uh, lessons that we've learned. The final lesson is the counter NWET strategy, which is what has taken us several years to figure out. And uh, this lesson comes out of basically knowing your enemy and you know his game plan. If you don't know your enemy and you don't know his game plan, then you can't deter him and you can't. Uh, have claimed to have learned anything from 2611. Now it's taken us eight years to uh, reach there. We first had the first big retaliation after 2611. Uh, that was in 2016. You know what happened in Uri? You had cross-border surgical strikes, and then finally in 2019, you had IAF jets crossing the border and dropping bombs in Balakot. I'm not getting into how many terrorists were killed in Balakot, whether it was five or 500. The larger point is that. Uh, Pakistan's nuclear bluff has been called, that nuclear weapons enabled terrorism has been called. Uh, it doesn't matter if the bombs fell on the camp or they didn't fall on the camp or how many people died. The bombs may have fallen in Balakot, but the impact is fall, uh, has been felt in GHQ Rawalpindi. And that, I think, is the biggest message of the attacks, uh, the uh, airstrikes of, at Balakot. The, the, uh, the government of the day has signaled resolve, the fact that it is not going to be deterred by terrorist attacks or, uh, you know, by Pakistan's nuclear weapons enabled terrorism. And uh, the larger uh, story, of course, is the fact that um, as long as you have an infrastructure of terrorism in place in Pakistan, which recruits, trains and pushes terrorists across the border, uh, there can be no business as usual with Pakistan. That's the government's line as well. And that has, I think, to my mind, been the biggest learning from 2611, and I hope not only for uh, about 2611, but also those previous attacks on Mumbai and indeed on the Indian mainland is that uh, 
one just hopes that all those lives have not been lost in vain. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Sandeep. That was a very fascinating story that you have weaved. I'm sure it's a result of a lot of research, which is uh, seen in the two books that you have written, one of which I have read. Uh, indeed, very fascinating. And I think uh, both of us should uh, write uh, the next book together. <laughs> Maybe we can make a difference. Let's, let's talk about it, sir. <laughs> Okay, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have come to the end of this session. We will now open the floor for uh, uh, for question and answers, and I'm sure our speakers will enlighten us uh, with their brilliant replies and their insight. Uh, Ashwarya, can you please go ahead with yes. questions? Yes, sir. One moment, please. Yes, sir. So uh, there are two questions uh, addressed to Commodore uh, Uday Rao. Uh, one is from uh, Sitriyas Atreya. Um, a very good point, Commodore Rao, about lack of importance given to coastal security. There continues to be a continentalist mindset. It seems to reflect the old martial races theory giving importance to northern states. Is this merely symptomatic of marginalization of peninsular India. Thank you. And the next question is uh, posed by Amrita Saha uh, to uh, Commodore Uderao again. Um, while we speak of proposals of uh, Coast Guard under MHA and multidisciplinary National Maritime Authority and with DMA coordinating all services, which is the one body which will serve as a true central intelligence agency and avoid future terrorist extremist attacks beyond state, age, and cadre divides amongst all relevant bodies involved. Uh, the next uh, question is... Uh, I should I just stop here. I think I'll yes. answer that. Okay, sir. Before I lose track of uh, these questions. <laughs> okay, sir. Okay. And I'm, I'm supposed to be the moderator, not the speaker. But nevertheless, uh, you see, uh, one is we are uh, to the first question about uh, whatever it is. You see, we are land lovers. Okay, so we that is the reason why you know you're talking of uh, peninsular India, etc. The fact is, we've been a maritime nation for several years, hundreds of years, geostrategically and uh, historically. But the fact is that we always looked up at the northern passes. We forgot that the invaders who came from the sea are the ones who actually colonized us, whether it's the British. Okay, then we had the 1993 Mumbai blast, which was mentioned just now by Sandeep. So there is a lack of maritime consciousness in this country. There is a certain amount of sea blindness. We, has, we have had so many seafarers. Our sailors draw, you know, use the monsoon winds to travel west and east. They used the Machi Yantra. But the fact is that somewhere we took the eyes off the sea. So maritime consciousness, maritime uh, sea-mindedness, these are something which we lost. I think if, it is, if we are now coming back to it, it is because a, one is 1993 blast to a lesser extent, but 2611 more. Also, the Chinese ingress, these have raised our maritime consciousness of late. Now, the major factor in this uh, is the maritime governance part. You see, we have not changed, we are not adapted to ocean governance, ocean administration as yet. Right. So these are the reasons why you know we have we have we were caught napping. So the important thing is that our bureaucracy is are all generalists. Many of them may not have seen the seas, you know, may not have come down to the seas. Many may not have seen a ship. Many, many may not have been on a ship even for a day. And they will tell you what is right, what is wrong. Now, I'm not decrying all bureaucrats. There are good bureaucrats, good, bad. There are good naval officers, bad naval officers. But the fact is that unless we recognize that coastal security is important, the peninsula is also important, we will not get anywhere. So that's very important to remember that maybe this 2611 was a reminder, but from, but I am I tend to be a pessimist at many times. I don't know whether 
we are ready as uh, sandeep said never again yeah it's, it's a good resolve never again 2611 but many things are still work in progress i hope nothing of that sort happens but i hope we really we had this national maritime authority i still don't understand what what is stopping the government from implementing this this is the single most and naval and strategic experts have been talking of a maritime advisor for so many years so if this has not come through then the question is why why is that even a 2611 can't wake us up coming to second part of your question you mentioned about intelligence it and an associated uh, you know statements it doesn't matter whether the coast guard is under the mod or mha it really doesn't matter it doesn't matter whether you got new department of military fl the fact is the government said that they will give us a multi disciplinary maritime national maritime authority which means that all other organizations be it internal security related be it defense related will all plug in they will maybe ha they have the reps but national maritime authority would be the headmaster okay now it could be anybody could be a civilian could be a admiral or whoever it is but the fact is that at the currently we are all focused on jnk northeast nobody is looking at the maritime so in you are talking of a true intelligence agency but the fact these are two separate questions the issue is the ip and the raw can give you to a large extent strategic intelligence i think the navy and the coast guard will have to generate their own operational level intelligence and tactical intelligence we don't require another central intelligence as you seem to suggest in your question we want the nscs to be able to connect the dots if you create one more central intelligence then it will only add to make things worse so we have got enough intelligence agencies in this country but they really have to pull these information mac is fine but who, the if the dots were connected we would not have had 2611 i don't know if there will be changes in the intelligence agency any post 2611 i am not aware but the fact is that we don't require any central intelligence agency adequate intelligence exists most of it with uh, the agency will look at strategic intelligence the navy and the coast guard have to develop their own uh, operational level and tactics which they are doing especially with the ifc in uh, in delhi so that is my answer to your two questions uh, okay now uh, uh, i show you the next question please yes sir the next question is uh, to um, uh, vice admiral uh, murli daran uh, and it's uh, posed by um, just a minute sir uh, by c3s chennai a member of c3s chennai um, the question is coast guard was designated as the lead intelligence agency some years ago what is the assessment of its effectiveness and what more can be done to ensure that coast guard is able to really become a lead intelligence agency in the maritime domain uh, thank you aisharya actually coast guard is not only for intelligence but it's supposed to be coordinating with all agencies for looking after the aspect of coastal security and uh, since 2611 too many lots of changes happened as you can i'll just give you one example when uh, the though it's a sad incident when the enrica lexi incident happened when the coastal police actually reported that the fishermen had reported some firing incident some people have been fired upon moment it came to coast guard the maritime uh, operation center were quickly able to uh, localize the area and send out forces contacted the chap and we were able to get that ship into cochin what happened subsequently is a different thing but the fact that you were able to shortlist and find out things so a lot of beginning has been made and it's a continuing on uh, it's a continuing process as uh, commodore rao was also mentioning so coast guard is the coordinator and there is enough we don't need another agency but so long as the inputs keep coming from the other agencies i think uh, a big beginning has been made because they're able to monitor the coastline and is able to get a lot of inputs thank you okay sir um the next question is addressed to um uh, the next two questions are addressed to mr sandeep onitan uh, the first question is uh, by uh, danish sankhyayan his question is did we have enemies within our country helping uh, let post and pre 2611 
And the second question is posed by Jay Manier. Um, how can India get rid of the ISI in absolute terms? Can we employ a strategy akin to the entire wipeout of terrorism, even if we have a routine, uh, even if we have to routinely cross borders and uh, synonymize it to our dealings with the ISI? The deep state has been a pain like no other that India has known since independence and its myst mysterious nature since 1947 continues to remain a puzzle. Yeah, thank you, Ashwarya. Uh, yes. The first question, did we have, uh, uh, were they, were, did the LET have help uh, in India? Well, there's no evidence to suggest they did, especially for 2611, but uh, you can't rule out the fact that they had moles uh, in India. There was uh, uh, Zabiuddin Ansari, if you remember, the one of the handlers of 2611 is actually uh, from Nagpur. And he was actually sitting there in the control room with the LET guys directing these attackers. That's the only clear link that's emerged. And there's possibly other guys who've kind of helped with, uh, you know, the overground workers, that kind of thing. But the entire attack was planned across the border. Now, the second question is that what do you, can we get rid of the ISI? I, I don't think you can get rid of the ISI. The ISI is, is, is almost a part of the Pakistan. It's exactly a part of the Pakistan army. It's an organ of the Pakistan army. It's staffed by Pakistan army officers. It's, it's, it's actually foolish to see them as two different distinct entities. Uh, the DG ISI reports to the Pakistan army chief. And this is one of the things that Pakistan has very successfully built this narrative that, you know, oh, we don't know what the ISI is up to. It's almost like another non-state actor over there. Uh, our strategies against the ISI have to be the strategies that we employ against the, uh, the Pakistan army itself. And that I, there are here panelists over here who are far more qualified to talk about this. But all I can say is that you have to raise the costs of what they are doing to us. You cannot sit for 15 years. You can't have your number one uh, economic capital attack repeatedly by uh, uh, the Pakistan army's ISI and not do anything about it. Uh, the worst I think we did in 15 years was not to play cricket with them. You know, uh, <laughs> so the thing is that uh, now we've seen a complete change in approach simply because you have people there who know, who've been through this game, who've kind of understood this thing. And one of them has actually gone so far to say that, look, if you do another 2611, prepare to lose Bal Baluchistan. So that comes out of an understanding of the game, the great game that's being played against us. And which is the reason that you see an all of government approach now towards handling uh, terrorism emanating from Pakistan, that we will not have any relationship with you, whether it's, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, cultural or it's uh, cricket or films or diplomatic or any other kind of thing that it's, it's not going to be business as usual until you shut down this infrastructure of terrorism. There are, of course, many other ways that this can be done. But the one thing is that it has to be an all of government approach and you have to make the Pakistan army realize the consequences of what it's doing. Um, thank you, sir. So um, one more question has come in. And uh, by Samuel Murli Dharan, that uh, the previous question was posed by Commodore Vasan to you. Um, the next question coming in uh, is, um, I don't know who it's addressed to. Um, it's uh, by C3S Atreya. The question is, why are there attacks only on Mumbai and not on other coastal cities? Mumbai being the major financial center does not merely explain this phenomenon. Uh, who would like to take on this question, please? Okay, okay I'll take it on. <clears throat> I think uh, one of the reasons, of course, it starts with the fact that Mumbai is a major commercial center and anything that happens there gets magnified to an extent. Secondly, you'll also see that there is a lot of... Uh, you know, it's very densely, thickly populated. People from all all parts of India are there for you know job, and there are daily people coming to Bombay looking for employment. So it is very easy for a stranger to merge in that group and activate. That is one reason. Secondly, is also closer uh, from where these people originate. Now imagine if he has to come down south or go around the coast of India, going to Chennai, etc. That becomes more difficult. So essentially, it is the commercial. Uh, Hub being there, it's a big city with lots of people all over. In fact, Bombay is probably one of the cities, even Delhi is not so bad. You don't know who your neighbor is, even when you live in a colony. You know, you don't know who your immediate neighbor is. It doesn't happen in most other cities in India. At least you know your neighborhood. 
So when a stranger has seen people exchange notes, that didn't happen there. And let me also tell you, when I got this thing, in the 26-11 time, I was in Bombay posted in a particular job. And the first input I got was that there is some firing going on in Kolaba, one of the, that's very close to the, in the naval area, that area. And the input also, that it appears to be a gangland war between two gangs because they're fighting. So as in charge of that uh, particular thing, uh, my immediate reaction was to tighten security and all the naval establishments. I told them we activate security so that no, nobody trying to flee the thing. It's later, <clears throat> I think that's why even the Bombay police probably took it as a, a you know, a gangland war and gangs don't, normally don't attack cops. So when the whole gamut changed, when it was, you know, realized that it was uh, terrorist, but it took us later, but that's the kind of uh, level that we had at that stage. I mean, hopefully things are very much changed. I don't think that can happen again. But then as one of the previous speakers said, we are not going to be, you know, nobody's going to repeat it because you can't, you have to, they will also be innovating. So we have to be that much more alert. Thank you. Uh, Komdur Rao, can I come in very quickly? Uh, yeah, please, please. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, my point is that the Pakistan army figured in the early 90s that, you know, you look at the pattern of the attacks and the years that they began, 93, 2006, 2008. This is when the Indian economy had started picking up after liberalization. So they were targeting our growth, economic growth. So this is not like a isolated thing of a small non-state actor. This is the the Pakistan state itself trying to stop our liberalization econo uh, economic progress by attacking one of the growth engines. And if you look at the targeting again in 93, it's against the stock exchange, it's against five star hotels. 2006, it's against uh, you know commercial transport, civilians. It's to create the illusion that this city is not safe for investment. You can't do business here. It's not business as usual. 2008 again, they deliberately target foreigners for the first time to tell people, look, Mumbai is not a safe city. You can get killed in five star hotels. You can get killed while driving in a, you know, commuting to work. So this whole thing has been to target Mumbai, this 15 year war that I call that the Pakistan army waged from 93 to 2008 has been against Bombay. And uh, secondly, very quickly, Admiral Murli Dharan is being very modest about his role in 2611. He's played a very, very crucial role in alerting the state government of the existence of the marine commandos and there's a very in my book if you read it there's a very interesting conversation where mr johnny joseph who's the chief secretary of the maharashtra state actually calls up admiral murli dharan because they speak one language in addition to uh, hindi and english and they communicate there and he says look i'm we're under attack what do we do so admiral murli dharan says well we have marine commandos you can ask for them and that is how the marine commandos actually came in on the night of 2611 and to my mind they played the biggest role there they saved 150 guests in the taj chambers and that was all thanks to that one conversation thank you okay i also want to add my uh, two bit here <laughs> you know you are yeah, that's a very good question but don't be under the impression that it will only be mumbai i feel the next target is going to be the gulf of kutch or the gulf of kembe you know the amount of chemical factories and refineries we have I th and being closer to Pakistan, that could be possibly, if at all, it would happen. I hope it doesn't. But it could be the target, as also our offshore oil fields. They also constant. And I am not saying this. If you see the newspaper, there are always inputs about some, uh, you know, thing about uh, Pakistani agents collect information about oil rigs. Similarly, sometime back, I read it in the Gulf of Cambe, Gulf of Kutch, etc. So while we hope like, you know, with all our uh, this thing that we don't have a 2611 or an attack somewhere, but I am sure as some, if it comes, it will come in this area. But I, God forbid, it should not happen. At least I'm concerned. But that I feel. So Bom Bombay may not always be a target. I think with all the greenfield refineries, etc., Gulf of Kutch, Gulf of Cambay, and all our industries there, it's a tinderbox. You know, that's my my thoughts on the subject any more questions aishwarya no sir no other questions okay great uh, ladies and gentlemen it's been a fascinating uh, little discussion we've had three eminent speakers was you know spoken at length and given their views uh, we could not have asked for anything better thank you so much admiral murli dharan sandeep Punitan, mm -hmm. and himadri das
Thank you so much. And over to uh, Commodore Venugopal. 